Welcome back. Richard, I hope that you had a very happy Thanksgiving uh, a couple of days ago. We had a Thanksgiving. <laughs> In the days of COVID, we had a COVID, a happy COVID Thanksgiving. That's right. Well, today we're going to talk about, we're going to talk, of course, um, the, the only topic that really there is to talk about, and that's COVID. Um, but we were, as we were prepping for the show, we were talking about how, you know, there is this emerging literature about some of the stress and mental health effects um, or, or consequences, I suppose, of, of COVID. And we, we've talked before about, you know, how everyone is coping with or dealing with COVID in different ways, that the isolation has been really difficult for some people, that we, we are seeing an increase in mood-related symptoms like depression and anxiety and some of those kinds of things. Um, but there is this um, emerging concern about, um, you know, some of the other long-term consequences, right. health-related consequences uh, of COVID. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. That's right. Yeah, because, we, you know, we had, we had talked earlier that, you know, we don't, want to, we don't want to spend too much time talking about COVID, but goodness, the, the subject just, just, it seems like it's getting worse. Um, right. and, um, and so there, there are things occurring with COVID that we, we just feel impelled to talk about. One of them is uh, we're learning as people survive, I, I think death rates are, are going down a little. We're, we're, we're better able to manage the disease from a mortality standpoint. But um, as, as people survive the, uh, this flu, there are physical, neurological, and now we know mental health, um, a, a, a mental health aftermath, there are mental health consequences. So you survive the flu, but you might end up with physical, uh, physical health or mental health. Uh, problems afterwards. Absolutely. And, you know, they, they were talking early on about some of the, what do they call them, crystals, um, in, yes. you know, that were to form in your lungs that could create, mm -hmm. you know, un, unpredictable long-term consequences to your right. respiratory system and things like that. And so, yeah, we're still, it's where we are now at a point where it's been around long enough, um, mm -hmm. that we've had cases long enough, that we can start looking at some of these long-term consequences. Right, right, that's right. And here we are, now we really are getting to the end of, of this um, eventful year. Um, and as we get to the end, we talk about transitioning to the new year and what do we do with the old year. And it seems like at the beginning of December, we really are at the, at, at the start of the holiday season. Um, and it's really here. We, we know it's really here because Black Friday, um, but <laughs> I, I'm very confused about, but not being a shopper, you're not, you're not either, you know, you, you and I don't shop. Um, and so I'm not part of that world of shopping and what's it, but it seems to me like Black Friday started in September or October this year. It's been um, going on forever. And it, there's an online Black Friday and a small business thing that, so Black yeah. Friday has been around, you know, Monday, it's a Monday, Monday, mm -hmm. Monday is Cyber Monday. So that's <laughs> After, after eight weeks of Black Friday, we have Cyber Monday, and we had something Saturday, Small Business Saturday or something. And so it's a sure sign when Black Friday arrives, you know, it's really, really um, holiday time. And of course, we're seeing decorations go up earlier this year. People are, people are saying, I want to, I'm going to start the holiday season and get a little bit of break from all this. And, um, and the election's over, you know, November's election time. So it's sort of over, um, kind of. Um, hopefully it's over. Uh, we'll know on December 12th that they, the electors make their decision. So I think after December 12th, hopefully it, it, this election, um, that whole sordid affair will come to an end. Right. Um, but we can, and so we, we, we be, in December, we begin to feel ourselves moving into new places um, and new year and new resolve and new beginnings. And yet, <laughs> Everybody's yeah. saying this. I'm so tired of this pandemic. Absolutely. I'm so tired of that. I, I did it again yesterday. I had to go into some place. I don't know where it was. And I got right to the door, right, right to the front door and said, I don't have my mask. So I had to turn around. Oh, I was going to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> got right to the door. So I to go turn around, go back to the car, get my mask, go back in. And we're all so tired of masks. We're tired of washing our hands. We're tired of lockdowns. We're terrified. Um, well, it's, it's so difficult because, you know, for, for the most part, you know, we still st remain isolated. 
you know, generally speaking, um, you know, some of us may have seen family members, you know, over Thanksgiving and all, but outside of work and school, um, you know, we, we spend most of our time alone or just with our, you know, the people that live in the same home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's becoming, it's, it's very challenging. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. And, and people are just, uh, everybody's saying the same thing. I'm just so tired of this whole thing. And yet we're tired of it at exactly the wrong time because now the people are letting their guard down. They, we did over Thanksgiving. I mean, people celebrated, they got together anyway, you know, more than, more than half of us got together with family. Um, and the same thing is going to happen in December. So while numbers are surging, right. we're becoming careless with, especially with social distancing and mask wearing. Yeah. Um, now there are cries of mandate masks. Now you see signs going up, you know, force people to wear masks. So we're back to that same issue that we've been fighting about for a year. Yeah, for a long time we've been talking about those things. Yeah, yeah. and we forget that um, even before this happened, you know, many of us forget that even before the pandemic hit, you know, we have we had a problem with healthcare access. Um, we, we were becoming acutely aware that many people don't have access to health care. Uh, there were several mass shootings that mm -hmm. occurred in 2020. Um, we still have climate change. We had an opioid epidemic. Um, we had all the politics right. of, of an election year. So there are many issues going on. And yet, and here comes the pandemic. And the pandemic just kind of keeps pushing and driving this narrative this whole this whole year. It, 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 keeps, it keeps taking over everything else. Right. There are things going on in the world that we, we, we almost don't pay attention to because of the election and the pandemic. Absolutely. And, and so you had all of those things already going on, which right. had our stress levels high, and then the pandemic comes along, and then that increases our stress levels even more. Right. And, and so we have lived in this chronic state of stress. That's right. Overwhelming and, and you know, feeling like we have no control, feeling as right. though we are, um, you know, just powerless to really manage any of these things. And that's why I think, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we see all of this outcry over wearing masks. Um, it, wear, you know, wearing a mask is the easiest way to, to, to decrease or to slow yeah. the spread. Mm -hmm. But yet right. we fight about that. We don't fight about it because it's really an, an issue with masks. We fight about it because that's really the only thing that we can control, right? right? We, we can't do anything about how fast mm -hmm. the, the, the COVID is spreading. We can't do anything really about um, what happens once we get it. We can receive right. treatments and things like mm -hmm. that, but, you know. Um, so we have all, there's all these things that are outside of our control. Um, so we work to try to control the one control, or two we, we can't control. control what we can, right? Yeah, exactly. And so what, what we're, the, the issue here that we're talking about is, is this increased stress. We've had stress in the election, stress from shooting, stress from healthcare. And there's all these, you know, like the, the, this whole election thing, um, the, the lawsuits that are being filed, um, regardless of how you feel about them, it creates stress, you know? So almost everything we're, we're doing right now is creating stress. And now we enter the holiday season and uh, how do I deal with the holidays? You know, do, do I see family? How do we celebrate it? What's this more and stress? all this stress, and we've talked about it many times, um, all the stress is creating a mental health crisis. It's it's not just the disease, whatever whatever the bio whatever the pathophysiology or the biological mechanisms are of this disease on our mental health. Even without all of that, you have all of this stress, stress from isolation, stress from anger, stress from fatigue of dealing with this pandemic. And we all hate it. And it's creating stress for all of us. That and and so uh, inevitably, uh, professional groups began to ask the question, mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is the effect of stress and what are the mental health implications uh, of this disease? If you, if you get this flu, what are the mental health implications? And there are two, um, as it turns out, uh, two studies have been undertaken. Um, they're, they're population, they're called uh, population-based studies um, of people who have had the flu. And um, one was conducted by the, by the CDC, Center, Centers for Disease Control, and the other by the American Psychological Association. Right. So there are two studies ongoing. They have some preliminary data um, that uh, they, have, they have each reported. And we thought, well, let's, let's take a look at this and, um, 
and um, see what the preliminary data show about the mental health effects of the pandemic. Absolutely. And it should make sense that there is that there are some mental health implications because, you know, what is stress but inflammation, right? Um, and we've talked about that many times on the podcast before that any times that anytime that we experience significant stress, um, especially stress over a long period of time, it, right. it can cause inflammation with, within our body um, in various systems that, right. that affect our immune system and affect our, you know, our cardi- cardiovascular system and, and, right. and everything. But it certainly affects our the, our brain and the way that our brain functions as well, um, and the way our ability to concentrate and focus and and some right. of those kinds of things. And so, absolutely, it's really important to be looking at some of these aspects and consequences of of this just right cool stress. Right, that's right. This chronic stress, uh, and as you said, we've talked about it many times. Chronic stress creates physical and mental health problems. Um, that's what uh, the ACEs score is, right. uh, adverse childhood uh, experiences. Um, it's that it's that chronic stress that creates disease, both physical and mental. Now, now we know. Mm-hmm. So, so we have a couple of two two major themes here, uh, two major issues. One is that uh, from the data, there are certain themes that are emerging as to what what are the specific problems that we're encountering, and the second thing is. Do does all this stress really trigger? Does it lead to right. diagnosable mental health illness, uh, psychiatric disorders that that are identified in DSM four? And so, what these studies are doing uh, to date is they're they're trying to categorize. Um, they're, they're trying to make categories of what are the problems that we're encountering. How is this how is this disease affecting us? For example, one of the problems that people have identified is uncertainty about the future. Absolutely. Um, that, that has all of us uh, tied in knots. Well, the, the main, one, of the, one of the greatest um, sources of, of comfort, relief, is predictability. Right? Predictability. That's we, know that, we know that from childhood. Um, when, you're, when you're working with a kid, if you can create an environment that, that is predictable for the mm-hmm. kid, the child does much better. Um, and it's, it's just as true for adults. If we, right. if our life is predictable, then we feel as though we have some control and mm-hmm. that we have some, there's some comfort in knowing what's next. Right. And so the, the uncertainty about the future that we have right now mm-hmm. is certainly a, a great source of, of distress. Right. People. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that, Bernie, the, the, in particular, this group, the 18 to 23 year old group, imagine you're going to you know you're trying to plan your college career or you're 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 ending your college career and now you're looking for a job <laughs> and right. you're entering this job market um, and where do you begin right. um, or, or, is, you, or you just spent you know 13 years in in primary and secondary school right. and you, you graduated in June and you had all these plans for what graduation is going to be like right. and you're still at home taking virtual classes with the right. college that you're that you wanted to go to so that's right so absolutely. all of that all of that has has just been um, introduced to all this uncertainty and uncertainty introduces distress right and so and we know what what that uh, leads to and when you're trying to plan uh, people are People are planning moves. They're planning relocations. They're planning house repairs, and nobody's quite sure what to do, when to do it, or if they should do it. So, so uncertainty about the future is one um, tremendous source of stress. Right. Another one is um, the whole issue of um, moral uh, human injustice. And during this year, we saw Black Lives Matter. We saw rioting in the streets. We saw looting. We saw all those issues. We're still talking about taking a knee during the national anthem. Regardless of where you stand on that issue, right. what, it has, what it has done is it has created what these authors refer to as moral injury. Um, when you take the stress from the pandemic, and superimpose it onto this toxic uh, political environment that we're trying to live in right now. Um, it has increased our awareness of social injustice mm-hmm. and the inequalities that exist. Again, regardless of your political beliefs and political persuasions, this pandemic, this disease 
affects poor people in a way in different ways than it affects the wealthy. Um, and there are more people in poverty who are getting sick. They have higher disease rates. They have higher death rates. Mm -hmm. um, this disease is affecting some people more than it's affecting others. Right. And whether you whether you want to think about it or not, the poor people are differentially affected by this disease. And it, so it raises this sense of moral injustice, uh, human injustice, and it makes us um, it makes us stare, uh, uh, it makes us look at this issue a little more intently. And that's creating distress among people. Absolutely. And, and it goes back to one of the first things that we talked about today, and that is the, the, the inequality as it relates to access to health care and everything that right. we've, been, we've been dealing with for years and years and years now. Um, and here we are in a situation <laughs> where, you know, good access to health care Mm -hmm. would help so many people who are disproportionately affected mm -hmm. by the by the pandemic. Um, and and it, it, it's one of those things. And again, I know we talked about it before, but it, it makes no sense. And this reveals my political perspective as it relates to this. It, it makes no sense that we wouldn't want everyone to be healthy. Right. Because right. when I go to the store, mm -hmm. I want to know that other people in the store are healthy. I don't want to think, well, that person, you know, that person can't afford health care because, he, you know, he or she's not working or because of whatever. So that person could be sick and therefore exposing me to sickness. Right. Why would I want to, why would that be okay? I don't understand. And, and so, yes, yeah, because the difference in the, economic the, factors associated with it, right. but from a, from a sociological real life perspective, we would, we should want everyone to be healthy. Right. And, and just to underscore that prior to the pandemic, if a fellow citizen was sick, we saw it as their problem. Right. Now, if a fellow citizen is sick, they could be a disease carrier that could affect me. Right. So even from a selfish point of view, we're suddenly aware and you look at poor people or you, and, and you think, is that person a disease carrier? Because I know they don't get tested. They can't get access to healthcare. And they are exposed because they're poor. They're not sitting at home behind a computer. They have to go to work every day. Right. And so they're poor and they're working every day. So are they, so even from a selfish point of view, I'm sudden, I've suddenly become acutely aware of the difference among us. You know, if you have insurance, this isn't a problem for you. Anybody who has good insurance, this is not a problem, but for the tens of millions of people who are underinsured or uninsured, this becomes an enormous problem. Now it's a public health problem because now those people are disease carriers that could affect us. And, and, and you're right, just from the common good, the common, the common good says, let's keep everybody as healthy as possible. Right. It's in our best interest to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the other thing we realized that, that we became aware of, and it bothers some and not others, is um, you know, the, 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 um, the work life, uh, if you're a bus driver, yeah. if you're cleaning office of buildings, you can't do that from home. You can't do that remotely. And there are certain jobs, if you're a healthcare worker, you have to go to the, you, you are going into the hospital every day where this disease, um, really exists. Um, also we learned at the end of the last school year that we said, well, we can do education online. Oh, not so fast. Right. 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 When you look at the number of students who had to had to borrow electronic devices from schools, whether it was a tablet or a computer, um, it was about a third. Um, and in some some schools, it was even more. Um, and in fact, some schools chose not to even do online, and they they just printed everything and get, you know and made packets the deliveries yeah. and had pay parents pick it up because there was just no way because they had so many students who didn't have access, not just to devices, right. but to, you know, reliable internet access so that they could. Exactly. Know. Right. We learned, we learned, we learned of the shortage that, that our um, internet system has. Um, we talk about high speed internet. There are many kids who don't have internet. They don't have any internet, uh, right. not only high speed, it just doesn't exist. You know, they can't afford it or it doesn't exist in where they live. And so it's not as, 
it's no simple matter to just connect everybody electronically to their school. That's not possible. We don't have the infrastructure for that. Right. When I think of like what we're doing, we're recording this podcast through Zoom. Well, mm -hmm. Zoom requires a pretty good bandwidth when it comes to your internet access. And sure. Zoom and these kinds of you know, um, media, that's how schools were, were doing it. You know, right. they, well, and they're still doing it for, mm -hmm. for e-learners. Um, they're meeting via Zoom or these different uh, virtual uh, right. conferences. And it requires, it requires a strong internet connection. Right. And there are kids who didn't have computers and they were, there were kids actually doing school on a cell phone. Right. Oh, yeah. That is yeah. absolutely yeah. unimaginable to me. I mean, I don't even like to use an electronic textbook because it's, it, I don't like to have to shuffle through the pages. They're doing their entire schooling on a cell phone because they don't have a computer. You know, and it's just, so it brings, to, it brings to the fore, it brings into stark relief um, the issues of human injustice. And, and suddenly we have to take a, a, a much closer look at all those things. And, and that was served up. Um, a third issue is the disruption of customs and traditions. And my goodness. That went out early on because, wow. you know, all of this really hit what in March, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then April was uh, Easter. And right. I remember, you know, when we think back, think about how people were behaving when they were told that, you know, you shouldn't celebrate Easter the way that you traditionally right. did. And, and churches weren't allowed to have some of the services, sunrise mm -hmm. services and things like that that they once had. And if people couldn't get together, it's a, it's a big disruption. And then of course, graduation. Oh my gosh, that was, um, that was huge. That was, I, I feel so bad for those kids because you wait your whole, I mean, it, we all struggled through that, but especially if you were a graduate, but imagine you go, you, you plan this your whole life and right. suddenly it's snatched away from you. Right. Absolutely. And, and schools did a Herculean job of having car parades and some different kinds of celebrations. Right. But man, it just it just, just wasn't the same. The, the, I think the most striking thing for me was the, um, the grief and loss problem yeah. um, that people died alone and you couldn't have a funeral. Yeah. You know? And so those are, those are fundamental traditions that we have. Yeah. Those and are they were, ceremonies that we, you know, funerals are ceremonies that we, we utilize to right. process the loss of someone. That's right. So you have graduations and holidays and funerals and weddings. Look at weddings. Yeah. You have a wedding and you infect half your city, you know. I mean, it, it's just a, all the traditions that, that bind us together and that keep us going, that, 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 that we use to renew our spirit um, or to grieve. We're, we're suddenly gone. And, and so that is another source of stress. Um, caretaker burnout, caretaker overload, caretaker burnout. Um, unimaginable. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, we are accustomed to, even if you're just thinking about parents, right? And not, not necessarily just having to care for somebody who has, you know, health-related issues or, you know, those right. of things, but just thinking about parents, you went from, being able to send your kids to school in the morning and right. they're, they're going to be okay for about seven and a half to eight hours and right. then come home. And then um, now you had them 24 hours a day. Right. Um, that's, that, that's about, and it, and it doesn't, we, we, I know that we wrote about this early on in our um, newspaper column. Um, it doesn't matter how much you love your kids mm -hmm. when you're with them that much, <laughs> you, you reach a limit, right? Wow. It, it's just virtually, I mean, it's virtually impossible because if, for example, when the school's shut down and kids are left at home, how do you work at home when you have the responsibility of your children? I mean, how do you make that choice? Uh, it's not a choice. Uh, you have to try to do both and the stress that that creates. And, and so um, many parents just gave up. I mean, parents, parents will tell you that they say, I, I just, I can't do, I can't do it all. Imagine if you're a teacher <clears throat> and you have children right. you you have to be online all day long yep. and you have the responsibility of your own children doing their work now right. if they're adult if they're if they're high school students and self-motivated they can do their own work but if they're kindergarten or first or their early elementary school students they need supervision they can't work independently absolutely and, and so you're caught between doing your job and taking care of your kids so every time the school's closed it creates enormous stress other people who 
are teachers. They're, they're trying to work from home, but they have kids and pets running around the house. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it becomes virtually impossible to manage that schedule. Again, another huge source of stress. Right. Yeah. And, and another one that kind of pulls these together is um, grief and loss. Oh, uh, again, dealing with, you know, how do you cope with um, grief and loss when you can't cope with it, when you can't right. go through the processes that you need to go through to, to cope with it? Right. Um, you know, whether it's financial or it's just the, the, the human contact, um, loneliness. Um, mm -hmm. My goodness, you know, we, we've talked before about how loneliness is one of the um, what, one of the major contributors to mental health concerns. Um, right. We are just not made to be alone. No, no. That I think of all the things we've discovered is the problem of loneliness, the, the uh, social isolation, what social isolation has done, how important it is for us to get out and, right. um, and be with other people. And I think of those ancient Roman and Greek cities that had that common area where people would flock to um, the atrium or where, wherever they would go. Mm -hmm. the, the town square right. um, was the meeting place. And now we understand why that's so important. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And then the uh, last that they mentioned, it has to do with trauma due to the exposure itself. You know, exactly. people who, um, you know, there's all this anxiety about, you know, getting it um, and, and trying to be safe so that you don't get it. And then, you know, you think about those um, essential workers, uh, people who had to go to work and then they ended up getting it um, and mm -hmm. they got, you know, sick. They had all this, these issues and, you know, what effect does that have? Like we, we talked about early on, the, the physiological effects that having been exposed to it or having had the, the, the virus, what that does to your body and right. then the long-term consequences of that, you know, that's mm -hmm. stress. Right, that's right. Um, you worry about it every day. Every time you go out, you worry about it. You know, uh, we were in the grocery store the other day and we're keeping our six feet but the person in front of us didn't have a mask and the person behind us didn't have a mask. We're, we're caught between these two people, neither of them had a mask. And I just looked at the checkout person and I thought, you just, you're just here's two exposures today. You know, hopefully she, hopefully, hopefully everybody's okay. But yeah, the, the trauma due to uh, the exposure, um, every time I go out, I think hopefully nothing happened. You know, and, and everybody's thinking that. Yeah. So we have these, I think there were six, right? Six areas of, of stress. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so it, it, it left us, I think this whole thing leaves us with a couple of thoughts. My main thought about this is how this virus is affecting people differentially. Absolutely. Um, this, this virus can infect everybody, mm -hmm. but it af affects everybody differently. Right. And that's what has become apparent to me. And the people who are being affected differentially mm -hmm. are obviously going to have more stress. Okay? So that like this year's graduates, uh, high school graduates, college graduates, it's a completely different experience. Those are the, those students who are entering uh, universities and job markets for the first time. I mean, we have, uh, we all know people who, for their entire high school career, looked forward to going to a campus mm -hmm. and having a college life. Yeah. And all those students had to have a, an abbreviated or online version, yeah. um, missing all of the traditions that typically, the kids typically have when they go away uh, to the university, or when they go away to college. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so those kids are, are, are affected very differently. Uh, those who can't work from home. Right. Or, or those who work in, in environments that, again, those essential workers who, like you mentioned, the, the cashier, um, but also, you know, those who, you know, custodians and janitors mm -hmm. and people who have to clean and, um, but all those, you know, healthcare providers, right. all those mm -hmm. people who their, their job is to it puts them right face to face. That's every, right. Every day. Yeah. If you're a checkout person, if you're if you're cleaning, if you're a cleaning person, you know you're the one cleaning all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's an office building or imagine the people who clean hospital rooms. Right. Well, how would you like your job to be to clean the emergency room each day? 
or to be in there each day cleaning. I mean, you're, you're putting yourself at, at, at extreme risk that I'm not, ex I'm not putting, I'm not exposed that way. Okay. I'm fortunate enough. And I, and, it, and it, it's just good fortune that we're not exposed um, involuntarily right. to this. Okay. So as, as we survey all of this, um, we really have lost our way. Um, yeah. There, there's a number of articles coming out of uh, Europe now saying that, you know, here's another way to deal with this pandemic. You know, the United States, face it, the United States has not done a good job of managing this pandemic. I mean, there's been one mistake after the other. But it struck me that uh, last week, uh, two things happened and, and they're juxtaposed perfectly. Mm -hmm. One is that Governor Cuomo in New York, they're, they're having a surge, another surge in New York. And so the governor said, we're gonna limit the number of people who can congregate. You know, you can only, and, and that includes churches. Right, okay. it includes religious services, right? Right, so you can't, you, you can't just fill up the churches. Well, the Supreme Court last week said, no, you can't, you can't infringe on the practice of religion. That's, it's a fundamental right, and so you can't infringe. That's an infringement on the first, uh, first or second amendment, first amendment. First. And so here you have these two completely different viewpoints and yet it's, why, do, why, because, why, do we, why do we even have to have those viewpoints? <laughs> governor cuomo shouldn't have had to say don't get in crowds right? right and the supreme court shouldn't have had to say it's a constitutional issue because common sense tells you not to do that right not common sense medical knowledge tells right you, this should not have been an issue Conscientiousness, just just being aware of what's happening right. should, should have let you know that, you know what, I'm not going to go into a single room that has 50 people in it um, <laughs> where people are going to be crying and upset, you know, right. not like a funeral or something or even a even a, a wedding, you know, right. people are going to be crying and emotional, which means mm -hmm. that they're not going to be able to keep their mask on because, you know. You know, Bernie, one of the one of the first things we learned very early on in this pandemic is that people, acquires who sang in church had increased rates of infection right. because you're breathing out this aerosol, okay? This is coming out of you. And so what do people do in church? They sing, they talk, they don't have masks, they're right beside each other, behind each other, in front of each other. I mean, it is, it is an absolute Petri dish, yeah. okay? So nobody should have to tell you not to. Right. And, and the Supreme Court shouldn't have had to weigh in on this issue. It was a, it should never have come up. Yeah. But, but that's what I mean by I think we've lost our way. Yeah. Um, same thing about wearing a mask. It shouldn't. You shouldn't have to mandate it. <laughs> I don't even know what to compare it to. I mean, we talk about seatbelts, right? We had to mandate seatbelts. But I mean, there's this common stuff like you don't drink. Here's an example. Um, you don't drink water from a sewer. Why? Because it will make you sick. Nobody, we don't have to have a- Richard, if there's not a sign that says, don't drink this water, then I think that <laughs> it's okay to drink it. You know, here's an open sewer, right? So, so we put a sign up that mandates that you, that you, you can't drink it, you know? But no, no, common sense tells you that if you drink this, you're gonna get sick, okay? You don't need, a law, you don't need the Supreme Court to weigh in on that. I mean, I don't, you know, you know, we don't eat spoiled food in this country. You know, you don't, you don't let a piece of meat sit on the counter for a week and then eat it. Why not? Because it will make you sick. Well, there's no difference. But, but here we have the Supreme Court of the United States telling you, weighing in on an issue that shouldn't be an issue. You know, why don't they talk about rot, rotten meat or rotten fish? Mm -hmm. But it, it just baffles me. Um, the but same with yeah, whether it's religious services, wearing a mask, just parties and get-togethers. I mean, <laughs> again, there should be some common sense, but we can't always rely on common sense. So you know how many how many parties, weddings do you, do you have to have that people say we made the mistake? We thought we could get away. I mean, there was a, a family on the other day and said, you know, we thought we were safe, but one person. Um, exposed everybody, and several people died. The, the, the grandfather died of the disease, uh, and and the people said we thought we were we thought we were safe. We took a chance, didn't work out. 
Um, I think that one of the things that we have to, that people need to keep in mind is that you, you have the right for yourself to do whatever you want to do, right. Right? right? But you don't have the right, you shouldn't have the right to put other people in danger without right. them unknowingly. That's right. That's you know, right. You, you, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't intentionally um, do something, what we would hope, you wouldn't intentionally do something to harm someone. Right. But mm -hmm. if, if you're going out and, and putting other people at risk by not wearing a mask or by um, you know, not practicing some of these safe habits, you, you are doing just that. You, you are putting other people at risk Right. Without necessarily knowing that they're at risk, and then they're going to get sick, and they're going to, you know, who knows what effect that's going to have on them. That's right. So you can do what you want to do for you, but remember, mm -hmm. if you're wearing a mask, that a mask doesn't keep you safe. A mask keeps other people safe. Exactly. Right. And that's what I tell people now. That no, it, may, it might be, you know, I'm I'm willing to take the responsibility and just say, no, I want to protect you. I, I think enough of you that I want to protect you, and and hopefully everybody will. And I hope we get over this mask thing pretty soon because other countries have done masks and social distancing and it works. You know, it's, it's not a belief. Go to other countries, look at their literature and everything says the same thing, but right. it works. This is how you do this. That's the science. Um, I, yeah. Why you don't believe it, um, I don't know. Um, and then, then there's this whole issue with the vaccine. Right. Well, guess what? It's science. <laughs> Guess what? Not everybody's going to agree to a vaccine. Right. So the pandemic is going to linger because there are large numbers of people in this country who don't believe in vaccinations of any type. Well, and Richard, we talked last week about the, the flu epidemic of, you know, 1918 and 1919, right? right? Um, and that was a flu. Mm -hmm. We still have the flu. Mm -hmm. The flu still comes around. Right. Every year, every year, um, mm -hmm. the, the likelihood is that the coronavirus, um, it'll probably get a different name, but um, this is going to likely be with us. It's probably going to recur periodically. Well, we talk about that's right. We talk about flu. It's flu season, okay? Yeah. When it, fall comes, and we enter flu season, there are many types of flus. Yeah, we hope. We vaccinate, you know, for those of us who get a flu, when you get a flu shot, for the people who get a flu shot, we hope that there's enough stuff in the shot to protect you from the various flus that are going to be circulating. But, but it won't protect you from all of them. But it's not going to protect you from all of them. You, you take the shot and hope that you're protected from most of them. This coronavirus has, is around. I mean, it's in the form of common cold is a coronavirus. Um, this is just a new form of a new expression of the virus. So this virus is going to be around for us. It's not gonna end. We're gonna to have to learn how to deal with it as we've learned how to deal with others. And we're gonna rely on science and we're gonna rely on medicine and we're gonna rely on vaccinations and we're gonna rely on healthcare workers to take care of us if we do get it. Um, but all that's gonna be based on valuable scientific information that we've gathered over time. And so to say, I don't believe it, well, it's not a belief system. It, it, you don't have, to, we're not asking you to believe in science. It just is. You don't have to believe in gravity. Gravity just is. Right. You know, it's not a belief system. And this is not a belief system. So if we want to manage the pandemic, including the physical and mental health um, aftermath, um, we got to get control of this thing as quickly as possible. And part of that control is, is going to be accepting that some of these things are. It just, accepting that, okay, it's safer, safer to wear a mask. There's your, there's your control. The control is I'm going to control as best I can the spread of this virus, and I'm going to do so by wearing a mask. Now, if you don't want the economy to shut down, do, do it from a selfish point of view. If you don't want the economy to shut down, if you don't want schools to close, then do everything you can to slow or stop the spread of this disease. Absolutely. I don't know what else to tell you other than masks and social distancing. Right. That, that's all we know. So, all, I mean, if, if you want to drink bleach, go ahead. Uh, I mean, other things have been recommended, but the only things that we know of that will slow the spread of this disease are masks and social distancing. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's little to argue about there.
Right. So um, as you enter this this next month, as you think about the close of 2020 and 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 the uh, the beginning of 2021. Uh, think about what you can do. What is your responsibility? What can you do to help spread, um, the, slow down the spread of this disease? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and take care of yourself, you know, right. exercise and continue eating well. You know, do those things that are good for your mental health, good mm -hmm. to relieve stress and, right. you know, take control of the things that you can take control of, but do so in a healthy, safe, manageable right. way. That's right, because we're all gonna be, we're all affected by this disease. I mean, this our, everybody's stress level is up and stress will damage your body, okay? So do everything you can to minimize the stress. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that is it for this week. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.